evening and welcome to the Wakefield School Committee meeting of Tuesday, September 12th, 2017. We'll call this meeting to order and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'll read the mission statement of the Wakefield Public Schools. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident, lifelong learners, who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. And with that, we'll go to the public comment period. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will move. Uh, into our consent agenda, and we have a motion. Move the school committee approve the minutes of August 22, 2017 um, school committee meeting and accept the minutes of August 22, 2017 uh, school committee finance and facilities subcommittee as presented. Second. <clears throat> Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank no. you. Okay. And, no. and we're going to go a little out of order tonight as we wait on our uh, business administrator. So I'm going to go directly into the chairman's comments and invite our guests from the Human Rights Commission to come up and present. Good evening. I'm David Watts, Jr. I'm the chair this year of the Wakefield Human Rights Commission, and with me is... Sheila Moran, and I represent the Unitarian Universalist Church of Wakefield. And we're here tonight because part of what the WHRC is focusing on this year is building uh, alliances with other groups here in the town to further getting out the word about human rights and why they are absolutely vital. Um, not just to us here, but to everyone, everywhere. And part of that, um, several months ago at a meeting, uh, representatives from the uh, Social Action Committee at the UU Church uh, came to one of our meetings, and we subsequently have been meeting with them and have put together a speaker series uh, that's coming up October 5th and October 18th at the Savings Bank Theater here in the Wakefield High School and I'll let Sheila talk more about that. Thank you. Um, our UU Church has had a lot of discussion about racism over the past few years. Um, a lot of it is centered around common read books that you know, we have read at church. Um, one of the books was The Third Reconstruction by Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, which some of you might have read. The other one was, um, while we've been putting that speaker series together, some of us read um, Debbie Irving's Waking Up White, which covers her own white privilege journey, and she's a local person from Winchester, Mass. And Debbie will be speaking in the BB Library in March 2018. Um, a little secret is that we wanted to have Debbie Irving in our speaker series, but we lost her because she's booked so far ahead, and she's very, very popular. So I urge all of you to not only go to our series, but also consider going to um, the library in March. Um, the UU Social Action Committee wanted to get information out to the community on whiteness or white supremacy or white privilege, whatever term you want to use for it. We wanted to reach a large number of people, but we really couldn't do that alone. Uh, so we did reach out to um, the Wakefield Human Rights um, committee to help us out with this. Um, and um, as David indicated, he thought it was a good fit that um, we both could benefit from um, doing these programs. Um, the reality is that whites have participated consciously and unconsciously in systemic racism over several generations, directly and indirectly, benefiting our white population. But this cycle needs to slow down at the very least. Uh, the two speakers that we have, do you have the flyers in front of you? Not in front of us. Oh. I don't know. I thought they were. Uh, no. Oh. No, we were bringing them in to pass them out tonight. Oh. Like last night. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you want me to pass them out? Yeah, if you would. Yeah. Okay. 
Let me just pass these around to you all. Thank you. Um, the first speaker is going to be Ken Wagner, who is a Unitarian Universalist. And he has devoted much of his life to the subjects of racism and whiteness. Um, he has had extensive experience in talking about these issues and does a lot of workshops. And he will be with us on Thursday, October 5 at 7 o'clock. And Martin Henson is the other speaker. He is a member of Black Lives Matter Boston, and he's an activist and an organizer who has spoken as well on um, these issues. And again, he will be at the Savings Bank on Wednesday, October 18th at 7. This series is free. We're very glad that you, you know, have allowed us to uh, talk to your committee because we especially would like to see young people um, at either one of these series or both of them. Um, we really think that the young people are going to be the ones who are going to slow down systemic racism. So I uh, would really appreciate it. Uh, the committees involved in the speaker series would appreciate it if you um, could urge the students and your own children to attend. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them right now. Yeah, just to to go on with this, uh, the idea is that each speaker will speak for a certain amount of time and then we'll have an opportunity to create breakout sessions so that people attending can get deeper into the subject um, while it's fresh in their minds. Um, and this also, we want to make an annual uh, event, much like the Sweets of Lectures in the spring. We would have two um, uh, lectures having to do with human rights, two talks uh, in the fall. Uh, but we would like to see uh, a lot of school kids, if possible, attend these these talks. Anything from the committee? Mr. Leakos. Uh Just first a question. Uh, did, have we appointed our new student representative to the Human Rights Commission? Yet? Yes, Talat Aman. Oh, right. Okay, yes. Yeah, he joined us uh, some months ago. Well, one idea uh, might be for Talat to... Um, uh, maybe invite his peer students, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking particularly um, our Metco students, you know, the Metco program um, is grounded in, you know, uh, uh, principles of racial equity. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps there's some even extracurricular, you know, um, connection that can be made um, with those students. And of course the students, you know, are all of our students at, at Wakefield High School or others, you know, that can um, be part of that conversation. And that's just one one idea. Um, and then we have a, a diversity. Um, diversity leaders. Leaders. Yep. Um, so there are sort of built-in structures, I think, within the student body um, that can help um, spread the word about this, um, I think, in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. And then just a, um, uh, a thought, you know, only because I just was at a meeting the other day, uh, the Mass Foundation for the Humanities, and whose board I, I sit, um, uh, February of 2018 is the bicentennial of the birth of Frederick Douglass, um, who had really, really strong connections to um, Massachusetts. And um, there are lots of really interesting public programs around the state that are celebrating his life and his legacy, including they do a reading of the um, his famous speech, the um, uh, what the July, July 4th holiday means for the Negro, which mm -hmm. is uh, a really, really powerful speech, and I would think something like that can be woven into the uh, our high school uh, American history curriculum in a really powerful way, maybe support some of the things that you're doing. So, suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have extra flyers? Or well, could, could, could I get extra flyers? Um, yeah. to, to distribute to school leaders? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, great. Okay. Let me know if that's not enough. No, I think that's probably fine. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. All right. All right. And if there's nothing else in the committee, we send you off with our thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see the school committee there as well. Yeah. Right. Thank you for doing this. Okay. Um, we will go. I will turn it over now to Dr. Smith. Uh, so first, I have a Quebec field trip motion. Move the school committee approve the Galvin Middle School eighth grade trip to Quebec, Canada, May 23, 2018 to May 26, 2018. Second. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Um, Dr. Smith, anything else? 
Just, it's a great trip. Um, they've been holding this trip for a number of years. I think you've heard people present on it. It's really, uh, really well run and just a worthwhile venture for our, uh, for our students at the Galvin Middle School. So I really support it. I also support it with my daughters went on the trip, yeah. and um, they they loved it, even though they still can't speak a lick of French, <laughs> despite their last name. Anything from the committee? All right. All those in favor? Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so the first piece on, uh, our next piece on my agenda is just, a, I have a kind of a what's new report for 2017-18 uh, in a, a couple of different areas. Uh, lots of exciting things happening. Uh, the first is in curriculum. So we continue to expand ELA and math. Uh, this year we've really infused um, a lot uh, of um, financial resources into uh, K-4 to leveled reading books at all schools uh, to support the Reader's Workshop, which is really exciting. And then in math, another extension is we purchased new geometry curriculum at Wakefield Memorial High School with an online component. I think that's been a, on, a long time uh, in coming, so we're excited about that. Uh, primarily, though, the, the biggest lift this year is in science, technology, and engineering. As you know, that was the part of the uh, curriculum cycle. And so we have all new curriculum in grades five through eight for science, technology, and engineering. Really excited. The teachers have done a lot of work uh, to prepare. Um, so this is standards aligned, high quality, uh, robust curriculum uh, for our Galvin Middle School. Um, in the K to four schools, we are piloting science resources this year. We last year during the curriculum cycle, we selected two uh, curriculum programs, and um, we have a, a science leadership team that'll be really looking at those very closely this year. Uh, in ninth grade, we have all new biology resources for our freshmen at Wakefield High School, um, which is exciting. And we have a new engineering uh, project lead the way cor course at Wakefield High School as well. Um, so lots of great things happening in science this year as a result of the uh, FY18 uh, budget. Uh, and then, as you know, this year we're going to do a deep dive on world language um, curriculum. So um, our new World Language Curriculum Coordinator. We'll be partnering with the middle school and high school departments in particular, really studying what we do, what the curriculum looks like, um, and making some recommendations heading into next year. So that's what's new in curriculum. Very exciting. Um, in instructional technology, um, as you know, we invested in additional grade two Chromebook uh, carts. So every for every two teachers in the district, they have a, a Chromebook cart to share, which has a full classroom set. So so uh, that really just adds to our ability to use instructional technology across the district. Uh, we refreshed our Chromebook fleet in grade five, which is part of the ongoing technology uh, renewal plan. And, uh, and the other uh, big summer project was uh, really completing, uh, getting a lot of um, mounted projectors for wireless technology at Wakefield High School. Uh, just about complete. I think they were on just a couple of last classrooms or uh, spaces, um, but all the classrooms actually are done. So, um, so that's great news for Wakefield High School. We're still really looking ahead to hopefully uh, one day in the near future looking at a um, you know a new or renovated Wakefield High School, but we certainly have a number of years of instruction to happen for kids to live in the current building, and uh, it really is about time. We, we had the, um, for a long time, we had the um, you know, projectors sitting on desks with lots of wires everywhere and people kind of tripping on them and uh, so really not an easy situation to deal with. So that's really exciting. Um, in facilities, one of the focuses this summer w were to uh, just transform the remaining libraries into more modern learning commons. Uh, so Woodville and Greenwood um, were target areas this summer. Uh, they, they look fantastic. Um, and then the high school learning commons just got a uh, a new rug and some a little bit of new flooring, uh, just to kind of bring bring the space up to date, and then just reconfigure the shelving. So l l really, all those spaces look very nice. Um, as you know, the Doyle uh, we added a new classroom, so we really had to reconfigure the space a bit. Looks great. Um, and the Galvin, we did the um, cosmetic repairs from the settling that occurred from the new construction. Um, so um, 
you may you know, I think you're aware that there was a little bit of settling in the in the middle of the building nothing um, other than cosmetic work needed to be done but that's what happened um, and then at Wakefield High School uh, we reconfigured the um, computer science space to include now an engineering lab which is great uh, the sound system has been um, replaced in the field house it sounds so much better if anyone's been to a basketball game in the last 10 years you'll you'll be very happy to hear the new sound system um, and in, even in our band room which is a really big space we had the ceiling replaced new lighting uh, and some floor replacement in the first floor of Wakefield High School so lots of great projects completed this summer um, and then under transportation uh, the bus routes are now complete um, at this point I'm pleased to say that uh, we have removed the final Galvin and high school shared bus in the afternoon if you remember we still had just one left last year kind of lingering um, so we, we were able to um, remove that route. So Galvin has its own routes. The high school has its own routes. That's the good news. Um, and at this point, we're evaluating all of our routes. We're getting uh, feedback from parents and uh, school principals. Um, and over the next uh, two weeks, and we'll make any final tweaks that we need to make in order to make sure all the routes are running smoothly. Um, and then finally, the as you know, we, uh, we're investing in some out-of-district fans. Um, uh, for some out-of-district students, we're, we're taking on that project, and that will um, we were projected to begin on October 15th. Hello, Mr. Pifferling. Good Just evening. in time, in case there was a bus <laughs> question. Um, but that's where we stand with kind of what's new in 2017-18, so I'll kind of pause there after that outline and just ask if anyone has any uh, questions. Mr. Callender. Um On the 5 to 8 science technology new curriculum, yes. um, what did we do for the teachers as far as professional development to get them ready to use it? So they actually had a lot of professional development all of last year. Uh, working with the uh, science curriculum coordinator um, in preparation for really understanding and unpacking the new standards, um, preparing. They were really they were in the they were piloting materials, uh, so they were using the materials to really understand um, uh, what what it was that, that we were going to select. Once we selected it, um, they've had some professional developments. So the curriculum coordinator and Doug Lyons have really run most of that work, um, and then now you know one of the nice things about having the PLC model is that the teachers meet every six days to really have conversations about how they're rolling out the new curriculum and how it's going and making adjustments on the fly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay. So that's the what's new in the kind of school opening report. It's been an exciting few days. Uh, not without its glitches, but um, <laughs> mostly very happy and, uh, and exciting. All right, next on my list. Oh, you know, on my other, it just happens to be next in the packet. Um, I wanted you all to know that uh, Assistant Superintendent Doug Lyons and I have signed up to attend a summit at Boston College on October 22nd and 23rd. It's a Sunday, a full day Sunday into a half day Monday. And it's on a uh, whole child, whole person summit, redefining achievement, education, and well-being. Uh, so Boston College's Lynch School of Education, which is uh, the program that I graduated from, um, is sponsoring this inaugural event. It's uh, it's uh, really pretty exciting in terms of progressive thinking about the whole child approach to education, uh, developing students who are not only knowledgeable uh, and, and skilled, but emotionally and physically healthy, civically inspired, engaged in the arts, prepared for work and economic self-sufficiency, and ready for the workplace beyond uh, formal schooling. So, um, and the, you know, the kind of the focus is on education for a life of meaning and purpose. Um, so uh, they also highlight global uh, relevance, uh, which just looks really super exciting. And uh, so we're looking forward to participating. Uh, that's co-sponsored by Boston College and uh, ASCD, which is the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. So I look forward to coming back and reporting on that um, summit. That was actually under my other, but it was next on the agenda, so I didn't want to, um, to miss it. And then the last piece is I just wanted to highlight, um, I'm going to switch from 
reading glasses to distance glasses for this over here, um, highlight a piece that I talked about at our school opening um, ceremonies with faculty and staff. And as you know from a lot of the conversations I've had with the committee over the last year, that we're really focusing on student growth. And the national conversation is switching or starting to change, uh, kind of tilting for, you know, uh, toward growth as opposed to achievement. Now, it doesn't mean that achievement is not important. Achievement will continue to be important because achievement's about meeting standard and meeting proficiency or understanding uh, where any student is in a point of time. But uh, this slide uh, that uh, I have up tonight really um, shows what we mean by growth versus achie achievement and uh, what that narrative looks like. So what you're looking at is four students, student A, B, C, and D. Um, and the greenish colored line is what we would, well, let's, the blue colored line is a pre-assessment, and the greenish colored line would be a post-assessment. So it's kind of a pre and post. Um, and that cuts across all subject areas. So that could be an assessment as in a test, or um, it could be a product, it could be a performance. Basically, when a student demonstrates after learning uh, what they know and are, are able to do. Um, so if you look at the uh, green line, which is sort of where the student landed, if a 70 as a score is considered proficiency, um, I'll just I'll quiz the committee. Which students met proficiency out of A, B, C, and D? If a, C, 70 C, is, is proficiency. So A, C, and D. A, C, and D. A, C, and D. So those three students met proficiency. They were successful. Uh, in, if you're only looking at achievement, what student failed? B. Student B. Student B did not meet profession, proficiency, as you can see. But now look at the growth metric. Uh, which student grew the most from the time they started learning with their teacher and instruction in the classroom uh, over the time? B. B. So it, it, if you look at, really, B had substantial, that student had substantial growth. So there was really probably some, some really outstanding instruction happening in the classroom. Student B um, really learned, grew, should really get a lot of kudos. Um, and uh, for, you know, for the grit, the perseverance, the hard work, the effort. And certainly, that student projects to continue learning. Um, so if we only looked at an achievement metric, which could be um, a state assessment or a final exam. Um, B did not end up meeting proficiency, but if we look at growth intently as well, we can see the trajectory that student B is on. Um, and it's certainly in terms of growth mindset and that student getting a lot of positive reinforcement, um, that student really get, should get a lot of credit. Um, the other really concerning person up there, student, is A. Who? Is A. <laughs> is A. Uh, because and this is a conversation we're having uh, when we talk about student growth in the Wakefield Public Schools is what about student A? Student A was really already there when you started. Um, so that student actually regressed slightly, but certainly didn't, you know, that's the student who comes home and says, I'm bored at school, I'm not being challenged. Um, that's the student who really, you know, is kind of, you know, really not growing. So when we talk about student growth and we talk about the professional learning community model, we're largely talking about teams of teachers looking at student A and student B. C and D are probably the more typical scenario. Student starts here, they learn, they grow, they meet proficiency. But the question question should be asked in real time, every six day cycle, how do we support student B, who's a little bit behind, might be struggling, needs a lot of you know, um, support and growing and, and catching up and, and all of that, but also what are we doing to support student A? How are we challenging that student? What do we need to do to, to facilitate that student's growth um, you know, in, in what they're learning and doing? So there's a lot of information that you get when you look at both student growth and achievement together. And again, I'm not saying that achievement isn't important. It, of course it is. Uh, but in education for a long time, we've put a lot of stock in achievement and not nearly enough of stock in student growth. So that's really what the conversation is about. And um, we're looking at student growth measures, as you know, in a lot of different ways. Um, and this is a lot of the talk of our professional learning communities and the work that we're doing. So I just wanted to share that with uh, all of you tonight. And it, I don't know if anyone has any questions or thoughts about kind of seeing that slide, kind of wrapping your head around it. 
Well, one thought is, um, and we've, we, I know we've had this conversation a lot, but the um, for individual students, obviously, the way you've articulated it, it's really, really important. But the other re reason, that, or the other way that this is important is um, in terms of measuring um, how well we're doing as a district, right? Um, because it, um, achievement in the same way, the collective aggregate achievement tells us only a partial story, whereas growth rates uh, for students tell us a much more important story about the quality of the teaching, the curriculum, um, and uh, but but the challenge, of course, is it's a it's a it's a harder, more complex story to tell, right? Right. Um, so um, just a, just an observation. I, I don't know. If it's it it's it's. I think it's just an important set of data to, to be able to share with parents and community members and the people who authorize our work. Um, but it's a, as you know, as you know, it's a challenge to do it in a in a. Um, in a clear and compelling way. Right. And, in la and, and those uh, points are all uh, really accurate and on point. And um, at the last meeting I talked about, um, I'll be coming out soon with a district data dashboard. And um, what we are going to try to do is really dig into how to show the growth measures um, and to really see the progress that we're making as a district in a number of like key student growth target areas and other target areas right. as well. Right. Uh, to see if our how our investment and our our district strategy and the financial investments of, of the community uh, are playing out in terms of student growth right. um, over time. Great. So that's that's the goal, and so that's the conversation we're having. One, one question. So student B, let's say the 70 is MCAS. So student B hasn't made it at this point. So there's a there's still a gap, like. I, but but they started. You know, I understand they started from a a, a place that was delayed. How are we going to continue to move that that student forward? Because I mean, I I completely understand and support growth measures, but the student you know still needs to meet criteria correct and i think the, the the really the point is is that that student has grown at a really exceptionally uh, fast rate or has really accelerated that's a large um, growth score right there mm -hmm. so um, uh, as I said earlier we, we can anticipate that that student will continue at that rate with that level of support so the goal is to catch that student up to keep making those gains to start closing that gap mm -hmm. so that even when you talk about the MCAS estate assessment you have both the um, achievement sto score but we also have the SGP or the student growth percentile mm -hmm. and that again that would would be that data to say this student ha hasn't made it yet, but how fast are they closing the gap? Okay. How much are they, you know, how are they accelerating? How are we getting that student from where they started to close the gap? So that student is definitely on the way to closing the gap. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, that's very telling that that student is eventually going to make it at the rate that they're going. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we have to keep up that good work and really understand what we're doing to support that student, to catch that that student up. But that is, that, that um, is really the dynamic dynamic of most classrooms, you know, you, you, you kids come to you at different places, and it's really all about, uh, you know, uh, moving all students to its proficiency, and uh, and in this case, student B has a longer way to go, mm -hmm. but has made tremendously good progress, and the goal would be to continue that progress in the next unit of study or the next grade level until they catch up. Thank you. So, so one variable, uh, one <clears throat> that 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 is missing from this equation is the length of time that's involved in that. Right. So is that um, whether that I mean that example it isn't necessarily going to be have an answer to that. But um, you know, I would imagine that with that if that if that's a year in a student's life, then 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 if that progress uh, continues and all of the other variables fall into place, student B is going to really exceed, going to accelerate beyond the success right. of the other two. And when I set this slide up for the faculty, I said you could sort of picture this as any one of, this could be a unit of study, so it could be 
six weeks, yeah. uh, it, or it could be as much as you know a year. Like you know, you could even look at that chart as uh, four different cohorts of students as opposed to four individual students. Uh, but dependent upon yeah. the length, right, the length of time that you're talking about, it would tell a little bit more about that narrative what you were looking at. Uh, maybe most typically you would look at that and say that's over the course of say a unit of study, uh, from a pre to a post assessment. Uh, but it certainly could be you could you know, utilize that over any length of time. But certainly uh, uh, the practice uh, that's going into what is happening in student B's uh, you know, classroom is is would be extraordinary. Is, is that's key. the story. To that's share. the story right there. Exactly. And like I say, the story of student A is not great. That that's that's a story we have to look at too. Like, what what are we not doing for that student? Um, and uh, and really celebrate what's happening with student B. Learn from one another about those strategies. Um, but this student A needs to be needs to be supported. So, um, like I say, I think for a long time in education, we looked a lot at the green line. We looked a lot at that achievement score, um, but we didn't do a lot of that comparative of the blue to the green. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's very, very important uh, in learning, as you can see, because if student A wouldn't even sh be on our radar screen if we didn't look at the growth metric. Would say, oh, the kid achieved, you know, we're in great shape, yeah. student's doing fine. Yeah. Um, but I, I would really have questions about what was happening. Um, by looking at this growth metric. So. Mr. Mass? Yeah, I mean, we can't forget about student A, but I think um, it's, I'm glad to see that they're focusing uh, more on growth these days. Um, my question would be, would you say they're focusing more on growth uh, nationally or with the state, Massachusetts? So I think this has uh, like been a, sort of an emerging national conversation, just to education. Um, this particular slide comes from the American Institute of Research, AIR, which is uh, their home base is in Georgetown um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but a lot of the work comes in from Stanford University. Um, so I think a lot of people just in higher education are just, you know, in educational research are kind of just talking about um, the growth metric and uh, its importance in education. So I just say it's, it's you know, um, both at the state level. I mean, Massachusetts is a bit out in front of things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I think it's a conversation kind of going on across uh, across the educational community. Excellent. That's good to hear. Yeah. Just to pick up on uh, RJ's question, I was as you mentioned the student growth percentile, which has always been an interesting yep. data point for me. But remind me again which subject matter that um, those measure? Are they just um, math, English language arts, and science? And science is yep. okay. Which brings up another part of this, which is that um, we, the, other, the other trend, of course, that we're trying to fight against is just measuring those subjects, too, through right. these kinds of uh, instruments, right? And, and, and how, in some cases, it is more difficult, for example, to do this kind of analysis for a music student or a history student, um, right? Because standardized testing is less uh, easy to implement, right? Is right. that true? And I think, and we're but I think that's why there? we shouldn't uh, put all our eggs in the standardized testing basket, right? right? right like right. The, that, yeah. why why we've developed other growth measures and common assessments yeah. um, at the district level. Right. Interestingly enough, um, was it was it a year ago? I spoke at the um, music educators uh, conference in Massachusetts. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. They asked me to come in and speak, and, and actually Mitchell Chester uh, was on the panel with me, yeah. and um, they had a national music educator that came in and talked about growth versus achievement right. in music education as well. So um, even though we don't have state um, assessments in those uh, subject areas, I think the conversation lives there as well. Right. And um, I think that's one of the things, as you know, in the Wakefield Public Schools we're yeah. really interested in yeah. is broadening that conversation not only to all disciplines, uh, art, music, um, health, wellness, right. social studies, right. and all of that. That, but also other aspects of student growth besides just um, you know uh, material you can can be tested yeah. on, yeah. like uh, students' growth and academic behaviors, right. students' growth and dialogue or discourse. Right. So you, you're going to see when we put together our district uh, 
data dashboard, one of the things, a target student growth measure that we've determined um, that we're going to look at pre-K to 12 or even post-academy is uh, student discourse, which is students basically being able to talk about present or exhibit their work to an audience greater than one. But we're specifically going to target math discourse as a great place to, to, to look at and gather data on students' ability to talk about math, which, you know, I, I really, this, you know, we're really, you know, journeying into some uncharted territory, <laughs> and I'm really excited about it because I think it can be done, it can be done really well. Um, and this is, this was the topic I had mentioned that at the MASC conference um, that um, I'll I'll be speaking about there on a panel, and then Dorothy Presser asked if um, you know myself and maybe Doug and maybe a member of the committee might be willing to talk about it a little bit uh, at her panel as well. So it's really two different panel discussions, really talking about student growth um, measures. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, Good so stuff. it's exciting work. But this is sort of, it's all connected, the growth mindset coach books that I gave you last yeah. time, the conversation about growth mindset. Um, I'm going to be writing a lot about that this year and sharing that out with um, faculty, staff. A lot, of, a lot of teachers are really investing their time in action research teams on growth mindset. Um, and, uh, and I'll be sharing that out over the course of the year. And that coupled with student growth, you know, the journey of these students, um, you know, they're really kind of all fit together. So, so that, and I think that's pretty much it. I just wanted to kind of highlight those uh, pieces, and I think that's all on my part of the agenda. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Piffling. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I would uh, like to express my appreciation to Dr. Smith and Mr. Tiro for taking me out of order tonight so I could attend a family uh, thing for my children. Uh, I do have the business reports. Uh, sorry, they were, came out a little late this weekend. It's just been a little crazy with the buses, but we uh, we did get them out. Um, you'll notice that we still have not encumbered uh, salaries, and, and I don't think it was an expectation that that would happen before this meeting. Uh, but we, it is our goal to have that done for the uh, October business reports. So uh, salaries are not encumbered. A uh, couple of highlights also not encumbered yet are people transportation. We, uh, we should be uh, getting on that very quickly. Uh, it's, it's a number that is known. And the other highlight on the uh, the local budget report is the special education transfer uh, special education tuition line is currently showing overexpended. Uh, it's more over encumbered. Uh, we will move some of that money over to Circuit Breaker uh, once we know that final number. And uh, when I get to the revolving accounts, I'll cover that a little bit. But uh, not really much to report. Still early in the year. Uh, unless there's any questions, I'll I'll move right on. Mr. Callanan. Is there a, a fundamental difference between this reporting period and the previous year to date one because is that there's a big difference in I the think dollars. that the, the teacher or the purse payroll for returning staff was processed on August 31st so it actually made this report even though the payroll didn't come out until September 6th or 7th or something so yes there's a <clears throat> there's an extra payroll period in this report that wasn't showing last year okay exactly it's about a, probably about a million or a little bit more. 1.2, million. Three. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> correct. <clears throat> um, so then I'll go right over to the grants. Uh, I did send out an email earlier today uh, to the entire committee uh, informing them of some information that we had received regarding our Title I grant. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we we're standing to lose about $103,000 from last year on our Title I grant. And the reason behind that is that our, our poverty level based on the 2015 census uh, has dipped below 5%. When your poverty level is above 2%, you get level one Title I funding. And then when you get above 5%, you get levels two and three. So now that we're below 5%, slightly below 5%, we've lost levels two and three. Uh, Mr. Lyons and I are, are still working with DESE to identify how that number dipped so drastically in a one-year period because it went from like 5.4 percent to 4.6 percent it's almost a, almost a one percent dip in our poverty level so uh, I, we don't know how often the census is, is used if they do it every 10 years and it just it dropped over 10 years or if it was a one-year snapshot we're not sure yet but we are we are digging deeper we're not just taking this as an explanation that you've lost hundred and three thousand dollars and and uh and you know have to try and figure out how to do that. Uh, but we also have gotten in our Title II grant. That's a little lower. It's about $2,000 lower. That typically goes to cover our, our mentor teachers, uh, teachers who mentor our new first-year teachers. Um, and fortunately, our, our hiring this year is a little less than last year, so we feel like we'll be able to cover that decrease. 
uh, and the special education IDEA grant came in also a little lower, about $8,200, or about 1% lower than last year. Uh, so I'll be working with Ms. O'Neill on how we uh, reallocate our, our plans for that, for that grant money. Um, the good news on the Title I is that the Title I grant and the Title II grant and the, the IDEA grant are all federal grants. We have two years to expend those. Fortunately, we didn't expend all of the money last year, so we had about $45,000 left over last year. So that'll help make up some of that $103,000 deficit. Uh, and then Dr. Smith and I and, and Mr. Lyons are working on the other 60,000, you know, plus or minus 60,000, how we'll, we'll um, make up that difference. And I'm sure we'll report that out at some point in the near future. Uh, the METCO grant came in above um, anticipation. Uh, it's probably the only positive on here uh, from a funding standpoint. We are still waiting on three special education grants to come in. Uh, that would be the 274, the 262, and the 298 special education grant. Uh, all total, it's about $60,000, 60 to $70,000 that we are expecting to come in, and we don't have any red flags on those at this point. So, um, you know, aside of the, the federal grants coming in lower, one substantially, uh, I really don't have much to report on the grants. Um, any questions on the title one? I know I hit you with that this morning, and I apologize for the late notice, um, but I wanted to make sure that I had as accurate of information as possible when I sent it out to the committee. Mr. Yakos. So I, I think I know the answer to this question. We talked about it at the subcommittee, but this means that um, we'll have to or we should probably um, plan for lower Title I um, investment in our FY19 budget plan yes. and beyond. At least yeah. immediately, right? So typically, yeah. uh, that's accurate. Typically, yeah. in our budget plan, we level fund grants from one year to the next. Right. Right. So, had we had some force, foresight right. on this, it right. certainly would have been in our budget plan. And um, you know, I think I expressed our our concern to Desi when I when I called Desi about the yeah. number that that it wasn't. You know, we didn't even get a phone call. It was a spreadsheet. Yeah. There were four districts affected by this, right. and you know, the courtesy of a phone call when they knew, possibly months ago, yeah. could have helped us in our planning process, but. Um, you know, Desi has been a great ally to us, uh, especially with these grants, the Title I grants over the years. Michael Seymour does a phenomenal job helping us out. So I certainly don't want to ruffle any feathers there. No, of course, yeah. And also, like you said, you know, finding out um, the source of the change so that we can know what's ahead of us, right? Because if, if things are going to fluctuate that much from year to year, that's something we need to plan for. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a, I mean, Errors happen. There's a clerical error somewhere. Right. Did we report something sure. wrong? Yeah. Did a census number come in inaccurately? Yeah. You know, is there something that we need to work with the town on on our yeah. numbers or something? I mean, certainly, we'd like just like to know where the numbers came from and how they determine those those figures. Right. I think information is, is key when you're yeah. looking at a hundred and three thousand right. dollar you know difference in projection versus actual. Thank you, Mike. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and then I'll, I'll move on to just the uh, revolving accounts. There's there's not a whole lot to report here. Um, the one thing is at the bottom is the circuit breaker. I was at our um, Masbo bi-monthly today, and Desi did announce that uh, the circuit breaker was going to come in at 65% this year. Um, a little lower than it's been the last few years. Um, so I need to now sit down and look at Ms. O'Neill's spreadsheets that she sent in with the student names and whatnot, not the student information, not names, but the students who we claimed for Circuit Breaker. And uh, for those of you who, who may not know how Circuit Breaker works, is uh, when a student's cost for, for services, whether it's in district or out of district, exceed four times per pupil average, it's about forty-five to to $48,000. So when it exceeds four times that amount, Anything above that, so anything that we spend on on an individual student above forty to forty five thousand dollars, forty five to forty eight thousand um, dollars, that delta above, we typically get between sixty and seventy percent reimbursement through Circuit Breaker. Um, so this year we're going to get sixty five percent of that delta back, um, and, and those numbers usually come out in October. But uh, Jesse did say that they're still waiting to clean up a couple of districts, and we didn't hear it was us, so that's a good sign. Um, but they they won't publish until they have everybody's numbers. So. Um, we'll have to go do our own calculation if we want an early estimate. Usually they come in mid-October. So 65% um, is the number. Uh, and, I, and again, just having that number today, I haven't put any uh, pen and paper to it to figure out uh, if if that will affect our special ed on the front page also. Because that, that that money and the, the overspend on the other side has to come over to Circuit Breaker or somewhere else. So we'll be looking at that, and hopefully I'll have an update for you for the October business meeting. And if there's no questions, I have, do have two payroll warrants. And I think they're number six and eight, Mike, right? They are correct. Great. 
Move the school committee approve payroll warrants six and eight as presented. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Do we have any gifts, Mike? Uh, no. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, not at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Subcommittee reports. Finance and facilities. Mr. Callanan. Uh, well, you got big news already about the, the, uh, the grants. Uh, we uh, are scheduled to meet again on October 3rd, I guess. 6th? 6th. Um, I did sit in uh, the other day on a meeting with the, uh, the, the FinCom, so we have uh, already opened up uh, dialogue with them to, uh, going forward to uh, try to be sure we have a, a, a smoother year uh, going with our budget development and making sure that they're in the loop like they uh, have asked to be. And uh, I'm sure that we just expect to get going uh, full tilt in October. Okay. Uh, labor and personnel, Mr. Markham. <clears throat> uh, the committee hasn't met uh, during the summer, um, although the superintendent and I exchanged a couple emails about uh, about needing to have a meeting in the next uh, couple of weeks, so we'll be putting that together. Great. Thank you. Policy and planning, Ms. Fortier. Uh, we just had um, our meeting right before this meeting and put the finishing touches on both the uh, policy and procedures for the student representative will be the non-voting member here on the school committee. So uh, we should have something relatively soon for the overall school committee to review and comment and hopefully we can move forward and have our student uh, be, a, be a part of us Great. soon. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, future dates and agenda items. Our next meeting will be September 26th. School committee comments. And Mr. Massey. Today, thank you, Ms. Morgan. Well, too, Mr. Kelly. Uh, just welcome back for all our students and congratulations to Dr. Smith for a, a smooth opening. Mr. Leakers. Oh, nice. No, that's it. Thanks. Ms. Fortier. I'm also, thanks. Mr. Morgan. Also, thank you. Okay. I have two. <laughs> um, the first is just I had the opportunity to um, attend and, and speak to the first day with the faculty and the staff and really everyone in the district um, and, and you know, those there are a lot of you here who have done that before, but that's a really amazing day to see everybody in the same room at the same time. And you know, it's 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 crazy because it's the only place in the world where the first day of work is so exciting to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, just the the energy in the room was really just amazing. Um, and and you know, Dr. Smith does a great job of of getting everyone pumped up for the beginning of the year. So that was a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, the second one, um, I want to address something that's uh, been a topic of discussion in town, uh, especially amongst some town officials that came up last night at the Board of Selectmen meeting. Um, it's with respect to an article that ran in the Boston Magazine, um, and some of you may have seen it. It, it, pertained, it was a, basically a ranking of districts, and there's been some, I just want to see if I can perhaps assuage some of the consternation or some of the alarmism that's been around this. Um, this data, and I had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Smith, and I'll throw it to her in just a minute, but I just want to note a few things. The data in the, in the article uh, did not come from the Wakefield Public Schools. We don't know how it was calculated, and I think, of course, it's probably important also to remember that this is fundamentally an article that ran in a magazine uh, whose main goal, frankly, is to sell copies and is overseen by editors and not educators like the very trustworthy and competent ones that this district hires to oversee and evaluate precisely these sort of things. Um, you know, my own thinking behind it is the barometer that we use to measure success, you know, as we saw tonight um, in, in our presentation, is certainly not what was present in that Boston Magazine article. So I just want to put that out there because there are people talking about it and, and maybe see if Dr. Smith just has any thoughts on that um, on, on that kind of front. Sure. I, you know, um, um Chairman Tiro asked me about it today, and I said I'd be happy to just maybe speak to it a little bit. So uh, did, did you see the Boston Magazine school ranking? So I actually, I, I really haven't heard a lot about it. People really haven't asked me a lot of questions. But like Rob, I did field a couple of questions from the Board of Selectmen on it because it uh, was brought to their attention. Um, I would concur with Rob. So Boston Magazine, um, their objective is to sell magazines. So it's not really an, an educational resource, if you will. Um, uh, I think it's important to, to really caution the, the use of comparative data and metrics that are um, not put together intentionally and th that uh, in a way that 
frankly makes a lot of sense. Um, just You could just start with an eyeball test, if you will. I mean, when I first glanced at it, uh, someone brought it to my attention, so I looked it up. Um, a school that is listed as ranked, so they have a whole bunch of different metrics across um, that, uh, you know, uh, everything from per pupil expenditure to um, class size to graduation rate and so forth. So um, they don't explain how they weight each of the metrics or how they correlate them or the meaning behind any of the metrics or even where they got the um, data or the precision with which they got the data. But um, one of the schools, if you think about kind of an eyeball test, one of the schools right above us, school districts, um, had a 74% graduation rate. Um, Wakefield has a 96% graduation rate. So even just, uh, you know, kind of like at that sort of eyeball test, you're really comparing kind of some apples and oranges, if you will. Um, if you want comparative data, the, the wise thing to do is to go, for example, to the Department of Education and ask for the DART districts, which are the 10 like districts. So on this particular survey, they've got the Boston Public Schools in there with 53,000 students, an urban district. Uh, you know, Wakefield's in there with 3,500 stu uh, you know, 3, students. You know, so uh, lots of different kinds of um, school districts all together. The Department of Education will provide, um, you know, a like set of districts, 10 districts that are most like Wakefield by a lot of different factors. And then at that point, you just make sure you, you just, uh, you know, target a particular area that you're interested in, and you wouldn't put all of those metrics together. So, for example, um, um, the... Uh, AP scores. So that was one. I'm thinking of some of the different metrics off the top of my head that were on this thing. So, for example, AP scores. So they had um, one of the metrics was the number, total number of students who take AP courses. And then the next metric was, next to it, was the uh, percentage of students who scored between a 3 and a 5 on an AP test, or the AP scores. Um, what that doesn't tell you in terms of are you comparing apples to apples, uh, would be uh, many school districts mandate students who take an AP course to take the AP test, and many districts do not mandate students who take an AP to course to take an AP test. So you're not even really talking about, you can see how that would skew the data pretty wildly. Um, for, just for example, the Wakefield Public Schools, we do not require students to take an AP test. If students want the AP experience, but they don't want to pay for the test, or take the test, they don't need to do that. They can take the course without taking the test. So, um, so again, it's really not an apples to apples comparison, if you will. Um, we've also been really cautioned by the State Department of Education not to compare MCAS and PARC scores uh, at this time, because as you know, we're in transition. So over the last couple of years, as you know, some districts chose to stay with the older MCAS test. Some districts like Wakefield uh, took the newer park test. Some, date, uh, some districts took online testing. Some stayed with traditional paper and pen. Uh, as you know, in that whole conversation between um, the MPA, MCAS and PARC uh, journey, if you will, uh, the percentage of um, students who actually took the test varied a great deal from district to district. So again, you're not really comparing apples to apples. So I just really caution that. Um, the other point uh, that I noted as I was looking at it a little bit um, um, with Mike and Doug was that um, the data was taken from from different fiscal years. So our per pupil expenditure was certified in FY15, I believe. Um, the park data was from FY16. So even some of the metrics aren't even from the same um, fiscal year. And that also makes a big difference because our, per pu frankly, our per, per pupil expenditure on this list uh, was very low compared to a number of different districts. Uh, but as you know, that uh, has changed in Wakefield um, and it's risen over the last few years. So if it was certified in FY15, uh, that was a year before the 11 point. point uh, four percent increase. So um, lots of, I would just really caution, I don't know if what I, I've just kind of described to you made sense, I've kind of just went a lot of different places with it, but those are some of the reasons that I really think as a, as a cautionary measure. I think the concern that I got, and I'm trying to understand um, what people might have been concerned about was, you know, uh, geez, we, we've just, we've put a lot of financial resources into the Wakefield Public Schools, uh, does that mean that either nothing's happening or, or whatever? Um, 
and again, as I, as I caution that, I think about, um, well, for example, per pupil expenditure would not account for the building of a brand new Galvin Middle School. That is a significant investment in a, in a community to make, and the, um, you know, uh, the result of having or the impact of having that facility uh, that we'll have on education for years to come is enormous. So, um, so I just think those are some of the things for people to think about. Also, as we infuse money into the school system with brand new curriculum, um, as we look at scores and things like that, we I think I, I think people can see in our district data dashboard will show that this is clearly a district on the rise, um, and we'll begin to see more and more of the outcomes of a lot of our investments over the next uh, five or ten year period. Um, but I just even thought of looking at it anecdotally uh, when the Hawaiian delegation came just last month, and the Department of Education had to choose a district that that they, in their opinion, uh, was really a district kind of doing a lot of the right things, um, you know, they sent the sent folks to, to Wakefield. So um, I guess at the, at the very least, I would just say this is a real, I would really caution people to uh, worry uh, about uh, this particular survey that was published in Boston Magazine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Leonard. Just a quick question. So did they, was part of the, I mean, I've seen, I haven't seen this most recent one, but I, I know how Boston Magazine does these rankings. They, do they rank schools? You know, what did this one actually rank schools? So you have from right. one to a hundred of the best or the best schools, right? right. right? The, the best, best school districts, yeah. and it was yeah. Um, yeah. it was Eastern Massachusetts. I don't think it yeah. went outside of the 495 belt. Right. Right. It was Eastern Mass, and uh, there were many metrics, and, yeah. and it basically it encouraged you to sort by an area that you were interested in, right? Okay. Like like class size. Right. But again, right. for an, a, another perfect example, when I looked at the class size, I'm not sure where they got that data or how right. they determined the data. Mm -hmm. But there's no differentiation. For example, uh, and it had student-teacher ratio next to it. Yeah. Uh, if you use the COTOP model, for example, special education children, that that wouldn't be differentiated from regular education classroom with one teacher. Or if you have a music program the size of Wakefield, yeah. so yeah. you could have a one teacher to 150 students would really throw that skew that data point. Right. Uh, I've seen. You know, a, so I was just going to say I've sense. seen a million of these, and I'm sure you have too. And here's what they ultimately measure, right? When you look at the final analysis of these things, at the top, Wellesley, Lexington, Weston, right? Yeah. Avon, Sherborne. At the bottom, Lawrence, Fall River. Ultimately, what these things show is income, right, yeah. as well. Yeah. Right? And the bottom line, that's ultimately what it's so all about. So exactly in the right. end, they tell yeah. you almost absolutely nothing about the yeah. quality of your right. school system. So I just say that. Yeah. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> well, and I just would like to add that I just would encourage people to not think of, of running a school as a competition. Yeah, right. Because we're not comparing ourselves right. to these other communities in a way that is not, in a way that's listed in this particular um, article. It's, it's not about a competition. It's about serving your community. And if your per pupil costs, it's $12,000 per pupil, then you do the best you can with that money. And you work smart, and you hire good people, and you do what you can. If you have twenty-two thousand dollars, then maybe you get bigger and shinier things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the education is is of uh, you know inherently higher quality. And I think if you really want to know a little bit of comparative information, which can be can be valuable, you would want to use the identified DART districts to do that, and not as a comp competition, as right. you said, uh, Ms. Fortier, but as just to, to really understand maybe where we stand in a certain uh, area with like districts. So, for example, last um, spring at town meeting, um, I was able to let people know that in our group of 10 like districts, um, 
out of the 10, we, uh, we, there was only one school district that had more, a uh, higher percentage of level one schools uh, than Wakefield did. And that was a direct result, in my opinion, of a lot of the new curriculum that we've been able to infuse in yeah. the district. However, if you go back and take those same 10 districts um, and ask me a question about, you know, again, it, as long as it's an apple to apple comparison about park scores, for example, who took the online park um, test, I don't know, but I would speculate that if um, a district is three years ahead of us in implementing, for example, Envision Math, I would ex expect or suspect that that district or those districts might be a little bit ahead of us. I think you will see, as we're infusing new curriculum, and you will see the results um, you know, with that. So I think it really would be just kind of looking at where we are on our journey and the progress that we're making um, is really what makes the most sense to me. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Smith, for elaborating on that. Okay, and is there a motion to adjourn? I move the school committee adjourn the meeting on September 12, 2017. Second. Motion's made and seconded. All in favor? Thank you, everyone.